So my name is Birgit Plantinga, um, and as I said, I'm a PhD student at the Eindhoven University of Technology and the Maastricht University, both in the Netherlands. And I would like to present something of my PhD project, which focuses on Parkinson's disease. So it's a, it's a little bit more clinical than uh, most of the presentations I've seen uh, today and yesterday. Um, Parkinson's disease is uh, a motor disease, or it's a neurodegenerative disease that mainly um, has motor symptoms. And I think, unfortunately, many of you will actually be familiar with it in your surroundings because the prevalence is quite high. 1% uh, of the people in over 60 years suffer from it. It's a disease of the basal ganglia, which is a group of structures uh, deep in the brain, a group of gray matter structures. And one of these structures is the subthalamic nucleus, which is a very small structure uh, located in blue here. And that's actually uh, what my research focuses on, but I'll come back to that later. For patients with Parkinson's disease, the first treatment is usually medication. And in the first years of the disease, this usually works fairly well. But after a while, since it's a progressive disease, the symptoms worsen. And often patients also develop side effects to the, to the medication. And at that point, surgery becomes, uh, if possible, uh, an option for these patients. And this surgery consists of deep brain stimulation. And this is also where the subthalamic nucleus comes into play again. Um, because with deep brain stimulation, during the surgery, an electrode is placed into this subthalamic nucleus and is connected with a wire uh, underneath the skin to a stimulator. And this stimulator gives uh, electrical pulses to the subthalamic nucleus. And this also relieves some of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. It's not really understood why it works, but as long as it does work, um, well, people are happy to apply it. However, unfortunately, there's also a problem associated with this procedure, and that is that some of the patients still develop some side effects to this, um, to this procedure. And these side effects usually manifest as behavioral problems or mood problems, so they may become depressed earlier than Parkinson patients without deep brain stimulation. And we think that this is caused by this very small subthalamic nucleus being divided into three different functional zones, a somatomotor part, a associative part, and the limbic part. And we think that the electrode should be placed into the somatomotor part uh, for the surgery to have the best outcome. However, if the electrode is placed in the associative part or in the limbic part, then we think these uh, behavioral changes may occur. So the question now, and also the goal of the research is, uh, how is this subthalamic nucleus divided into these functional uh, zones, and uh, can we find them? So to this end, we scanned four healthy subjects on an ultra-high field, so seven Tesla MRI scanner, which is located in Maastricht. And we performed sort of standard anatomical imaging and uh, diffusion-weighted imaging, which can be used for uh, tractography of the brain, so uh, tracking the fibers in the brain. Um, so this is an example of the results. Can you still hear me properly? Okay. Um, this is an example of the results. Now not, right? Okay, it felt like I was dropping off. Okay. Um, on, on your right, you see the uh, anatomical imaging that we have in our study, and on the left, as a comparison, you see a three Tesla image uh, from the literature. And on these anatomical images, we can quite neatly, by hand, delineate the subthalamic nucleus. And from this subthalamic nucleus, we performed fiber tracking with the diffusion-weighted images. And we see that uh, the fibers going upwards from the subthalamic nucleus can actually uh, be divided into three major fiber bundles. There's a fiber bundle in green, which goes to the premotor area, one in red that goes to the inferior frontal area, and in blue you can see a fiber bundle going to the internal globus pallidus. So if we know this, uh, these three uh, locations or destinations have different functions. So if we then can look back in the subthalamic nucleus where these three fiber bundles originate, we have an estimate of the functional subdivision. So we did this, and for one 
uh, example, this looks like this. I can zoom in on this. So this is the actual plane like this, and then we also have a coronal plane like this. And what we see is that the fibers that go to the premotor area actually originate from the posterior lateral part of the SGN. Those that go to the inferior frontal area originate from the dorsal lateral part of the SGN. And those that go to the internal globus pallidus originate from the anterior medial part of the SGN. But this is the example of one STN, but we have four subjects, so eight STNs. And in general, you see that in seven out of those eight STNs, the fibers that go to the premotor area, the, the part of the brain that's involved in movement, originate from the posterior lateral uh, part of the subthalamic nucleus. Those that go to the inferior frontal area, which is, among other things, involved in motion inhibition, so more complex motor control, um, they originate from the dorsal lateral part of the STN. And the fibers that go to the internal globus pallidus, which is involved in limbic processing, they originate from the anteromedial part of the subthalamic nucleus. So in conclusion, this, uh, although they, their preliminary results only in a few healthy subjects, uh, suggest that there is indeed a functional subdivision of the subthalamic nucleus and that this way we may be able to separate between limbic and motor pro processes within the subthalamic nucleus. And uh, of course, we hope that in the end this may lead to improved targeting on an individual subject level for deep brain stimulation. Uh, but our first step for the future is to also validate if we can still find this subdivision if we scan patients instead of healthy volunteers. So I would like to thank my supervisors and my colleagues who, who also work on this research. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. Yes, go ahead. I'm just wondering, what's the dimensions of the electrode compared to the size of the subthalamic nucleus? I was wondering whether maybe another possibility is that the stimulation is quite fierce that it sort of leaks out into other tissues. Yes, yes, that's a, actually a very good possibility. And there are also um, research that suggests that you should actually not stimulate the subthalamic nucleus, but some of the adjacent areas. Some research suggests you should stimulate the subthalamic nucleus, some research suggests you should uh, stimulate just outside of it. So that's actually a very good point. And I think in... Um, in fact, you don't only stimulate the subthalamic nucleus, but also some of the surrounding area. The, uh, the electrode itself is, um, I think, about one, one millimeter in, uh, in diameter, and the subthalamic nucleus is um, about five, six millimeter in every dimension. But the, uh, but the potential field is bigger, of course, yeah. Um, are these electrodes currently MRI safe? So could you, for example, go back to patients that either have side effects or don't have side effects and then retrogradely check where the electrode was placed? Um, yes, officially um, they are not MRI safe, um, but um, you can put patients in an MRI scanner of 1.5 Tesla. That's being done. Um, so. so if you, if you read the Mctronic guidelines, they are very ambiguous on whether you can do it or not, but it's being done. And otherwise, you can also do CT post-operative. Yeah. 